question of the ITB virtual convention. And our title today is COVID-19, is it a catalyzator or pitfall for sustainability and tourism? Let me introduce myself. I'm Reka Jean-Francois and I'm the Commissioner for Corporate Social Responsibility at ITB Berlin since many years. I'm very engaged in sustainability. So it is really a pleasure for me to be uh, moderating the session today. So thanks for joining us. I think it's a very important subject to discuss whether the corona pandemic will lead to more sustainability or, or will the opposite happen? Will we forget all about it just to survive? So before I start and before I introduce our distinguished uh, panelists, I want to bring to your attention first to our Slido poll. So you will have to choose whether you agree or you don't agree or you're not sure if the COVID-19 pandemic leads to more sustainability and climate protection. So thanks for taking part now. Please just click on pulse. Well, in the meantime, while we are waiting for the results, let us welcome our panelists. First of all, I want to welcome Lucien Dam. She is Senior Environmental Manager of TUI Cruises. She is a political scientist working in the sustainable field since over 13 years, I think now. And for nine years, she's already with TUI Cruises. TUI Cruises is a German premium cruise line operator. She's responsible for the company's environmental strategy and manages um, all the reporting and everything related to CSR. So she's always very engaged also for sustainability and for innovations. And since 2015, she's also chairwoman of uh, Futuris. And in her background, she's also been working with NABU, a nature conversation, NGO, and so on. So Lucien, welcome. I'm very happy that you are with us. Then second, I want to welcome Randy Durbin. He's the CEO of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council, the GSCC. IDB is part of it. It's a UN-supported NGO that established and managed global baseline standards for sustainability in travel and tourism. That's a very important role. And the GSCC criteria include guidelines. So it's a practical approach. Um, well, Randy has 24 years of uh, senior leadership roles with the major tour operators. Also, you've been with TUI also, also, right, Randy? And your second career was really um, working in uh, development projects. You've been advising uh in development in developing countries in asia and south america and yeah also including rural tourism and right now you're based in korea welcome randy for being with us and third we want to welcome peter murray Kupsch. we all know him very well also because Tosiosis is one of the big um tour operators who have the well the sustainability in their dna he took over from his father in 1987 and uh, he's based in Munich and he's also very active in the sustainability field as he is a founding member of the Studienkreis for Tourism Development and he's also founder of the Studios Foundation and also founding member as ITB is of the Roundtable for Human Rights and Tourism. Thank you Mari for joining. And last not least, it's Julia Messe, Vice President, Global Sustainability, Kempinski Hotels. And she develops the company's standards and initiatives that redefine sustainability. She's also already 14 years of experience in consulting, including sustainability um, manager as OMV, which, which is Austria's largest oil and gas company. She holds a Master of Science in environmental sciences and policy and as a bachelor in international relations so thank you all for being with us i think we have a lot of expertise with us so before we take now a look at the poll results 
some more housekeeping information, please, we want to invite you, our auditorium, to, to ask questions. We want you to, to contribute. So please don't hesitate to use the Q&A button and to send your commands or questions for the speakers. We would also love if you, if you would share the session on social media and please use the hashtag ITVVirtualCom or ITV Now, our new virtual platform. So thank you. That's enough housekeeping, enough of introduction. Now, before we dive into our discussion, just let us check the results of the, of the polls. Can we see the poll results now? Can somebody else read it? I think I have a problem to read it. Randy, can you read it? Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. Do you hear me? Yeah. Can you please read it for me? If you because hear me. It... Yeah. Yes, yeah. I do. Happy to. The I. It's a strong agreement. Seventy-six percent agrees with the statement. Fifteen percent says wow. I don't know, and nine percent I do not agree. Okay. Thank you, Randy, for helping out. So, well, a lot of people really agree, and that is that brings us right into the middle of the discussion. Before the, um, the COVID pandemic, the environmental movement was stronger than ever before. I mean, especially the generations that Greta Thunberg was leading the uprise. There was like, we are in the middle of a climate breakdown that, that had become nearly common sense. But after the pandemic showed up when the world was suddenly hit by the unexpected virus um everything changed but as globally so many businesses are suffering even going bankrupt will the strongest focus of policymakers and companies be on economic recovery rather than on the environmental recovery will we try to recover whatever it takes even making the same mistakes, you know, chasing unlimited growth in a limited planet? Or will we really rethink and try to transform tourism without leaving those behind who have been losing their job and their business due to cholera? Will sustainability, climate protection, regeneration of tourism, as well as social responsibility and sensibility shift back into the global focus? Will travel automatically become more sustainable as travelers prefer domestic trips? Start avoiding air travel and cruises? Stay in apartment and villas rather than in big hotels? And replace city trips with remote nature experiences? These are the questions for us today. So how are the future plans of tour operators, of cruise ship operators, of hoteliers? That's why we invited you, because you represent those groups. Um, Randy, you are not part of this group because you, um, you work with an NGO, with GSCC, as we've been talking before. So um, being the CEO of this most trustful uh, organization, which offers really concrete tools to all tourism players. What is your opinion? Will politicians use the reset to push sustainability or will the focus initially be on economic recovery? Randy. Well, I think in the public sector, what we're seeing at GSTC is there's as much focus now as ever, perhaps more. Um, I think it's only in the past five or 10 years that we've seen a strong uptick in the public sector awareness and focus on sustainability. And actually during the travel pause this year, we've been engaged with governments around the world more than ever. Um, so that's a very good sign. So whereas the private sector has to fight for survival and we don't know where the totality of the private sector is going to go. Um, and of course, we'll talk more about that during the course of the panel. But what we've seen at GSTC is, is, is more activism in the public sector, which is very encouraging, which is a continuation of a trend. Um, so very, very hopeful 
um, at the destination management level and at the national and subnational policy level. So um, where do we stand? What do you think? Where do we stand with regard to, to, to policymakers, to global frameworks for sustainability and climate protection? You know, there is a, in the in the in Europe we have the European Green Deal, but there are also other um, other programs from from uh, international standards from UN WTO, WTTC, everybody climate protection agreements. You know, so is there help and support? What do you think? What can we do? I think there is help and support from the public sector. I think there is help and support from the public sector. And I, you know, what we've seen just in terms of some governments we've been working with since 2015 with Indonesia, working on de destination development throughout their country. Last year, Japan travel agency, a tourism agency, it's actually the ministry, um, has a full fledged destination support campaign. Greece is much more active. Norway is doing interesting things around the world. We're seeing governments engaged in a way that was unimaginable 10 years ago. Um, so I think there's been yeah. a great awakening. I think the over tourism awareness of the past five years, um, to a large extent was a European phenomenon, but I think it raised consciousness throughout the world because I think traditionally governments thought they were only supposed to promote tourism and they didn't know that they should plan and develop. I mean, that's really only the past 10 years. We've seen that in a significant way, really anywhere in the world. And we've seen tremendous uh, movement in that direction in the past five years. And I'm very happy to report all indications we have is that that has actually accelerated during the pandemic because those people who've been moving more into policy, including sustainability, have a pause in the action because with the travel pause, the businesses they interact with are going nowhere. They're not going to trade shows. They're not going to mess of Berlin uh, and all that. So, and those civil, civil servants have kept their jobs. Whereas many travel private sector people are furloughed or lost their jobs. The civil servants are in place. And so we've seen quite a few of them mm -hmm. highly engaged. It's very encouraging. Thank you, um, Randy. I would like to, to go to Lucien now because she represents the, the cruise um, sector. So, uh, Lucien, do you agree? Uh, what is your opinion? Especially yeah, for, um, for cruises, which is very sensible. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, um, First of all, I think I can um, absolutely support what Wendy just said, because we are still in a lot of contact with our um, networks and our partners in, at NGO level, but also um, on, on state and public policy levels. And there's a lot of engagement here. Um, I think I got so many emails from them because they are really working on programs and stuff. So it's, it's really kind of, you know, I'm trying to catch up with that. Um, Sadly, of course, um, also the cruise industry was um, hit very strong and very hard by the pandemic. Um, nevertheless, I, as you can see, I've kept my job as uh, as up to now, and um, I'm still optimistic. I have my job also next summer. Um, of course, we we have a lot of um, short work in place, but also ships that are not in service. So um, normally um, our workload is reduced by that, but um, I can actually transfer the picture Randy just draw from the public sector to the private sector, because although the operation is limited, we have a lot of strategics, um, strategic topics we are now working on. We have still new builds in, um, in order books. We are wor working here. We um, go through our policies to our monitoring systems. We are doing kind of maintenance to, um, to our um, management system in, um, in regards of environmental um uh, mm. topics and um we also have a lot of time to follow up on what is um what is now happening on the political agenda and i wouldn't say here that there's any standstill there's a lot of progress moving forward on the eu level on the imo level on the maritime industry there's a lot of um climate protection laws coming also new regulation and limits 
So um, I don't see there actually any long-term or mid-term effects on sustainability. Um, it's it's really for me very um, optimistic. Look forward. There's a lot of stuff actually coming, um, and I'm hopefully can work then full time to really uh, be there. Yeah, Lu Lucien. I mean, two cruises. They are there with uh, Aida and some projects. You know, with um, um, from cradle to cradle materials and so on. You have been like. Um, yeah, a, a good example, a best practice, practice for what cruises can do. But you know, we all know there are a lot of uh, um, cruise ship operators who are not uh, on the same level. So do you expect now, because after Corona, that, that politicians, just to save those uh, cruise ship companies, um, that politicians will tighten? Um, the relaxations or, or, or to save then relax the regulations on sustainability uh, of cruises? Actually, I, I don't see that, that there's any um, softening of, of laws coming here. Um, uh, I mean, there's, of course, we know that from the business side that there are some, some, some regulations a little bit, you know, um, for when it comes to um, to bankruptcy or so, so ever. So in the private sector here in Germany, we had this kind of of signals from the politicians for struggling businesses. But I think on a policy level, really, um, uh, there is actually no talk I'm aware of that there is um, that there will be some some stuff postponed or or not. I mean, in the cruise industry, a lot of these uh, policies um, affect the fleets. There's a lot of hardware involved. There's a long time of adaption to policies. So I don't see that that within a year or even two years of of, uh, of a you know low key cruise industry that there will be any softening of of, of policies actually. And I, and personally personally, I would say that's really not the right sign to send out um, to the cruise industry, but also to um, to the public as well. Um, we have done a lot of homework over the last couple of years and we are still um, working on it very hard. And um, I think even if you have different company philosoph philosophies to sustainability, I think everyone is on a, on a same ground page. And then, of course, you have the industry leaders, and they will keep up with the pace. I'm, I'm very confident here. Oh, so that's that's good news, you know, because um, yeah, some of us were really afraid that um, we will go back to to old patterns. So, um, Julia, from a hotelier's perspective, yes. I think it's also interesting because large hotel chains uh, they will certainly have to cope with major economic problems in the long term too, and they will have to fight hard for survival in, in, in some cases. As we mentioned before, a lot of people uh, just prefer to stay in um, either homestays or small apartments, you know, villas and et cetera, but um, are afraid to stay in, in hotel chains. Um, well, on the other side, hotels have done their homework, you know, they got prepared with new hygienic standards and so on. So, um, what do you think against the, the, the background which we just have? Um, are there any financial resources at all um, available for sustainability measures uh, in, for hoteliers? Um, or are you expecting more subsidies from governments? What is, what is your statement, Julia? Right. Well, uh, as of the first part, so maybe about subsidies, uh, I can mention a bit later, but from the first part, I would like to highlight that um, sustainable business model of the business operation is applicable across all sectors, be it hospitality, be it oil and gas, be it pharmaceutical, be it any sector. And we should not forget that uh, it includes three pillars, so environmental, social, and economic and financial. So the concept of sustainability, if the business respects the needs of stakeholders in, uh, in the social aspect, if it takes care about environment, then it will turn into a better performing financial model, which is proven by a lot of studies and performances 
of uh, companies uh, in different sectors, such as Unilever, uh, Unilever, other companies. So that's a proven fact, and we should uh, think about sustainability as a business approach, business model of for any in any sector. Talking about hospitality in particular, as an example, uh, in this scenario, so sustainable approach dictates that we foresee the risks and we seize the opportunities that come for, for the topics that are relevant for the business. In our case, uh, I would like to give an example of three risks that we have seen as moving closer due to coronavirus uh, and this pandemic has highlighted such risks. The first risk uh, is, um, is the risk uh, related to human rights, to the society. I would like to put it first because today, 10th of December, is the International Day of Human Rights. So that's why I would like to highlight this risk. Uh, we see a lot of people losing jobs. So it's uh, foreseen that uh, around 70 million people might enter in addition to the extreme poverty, in addition to over 700 million that currently are there, making situation uh, difficult for tourism in a sense that, you know, when you have poverty, the crime comes, the security of the place is damaged and this damages also the tourism. So uh, the second risk that moved closer is climate change. So climate change was not going anywhere. That's true that emissions were reduced this year. It's estimated between 4-7% uh, greenhouse gas emissions went down. However, as uh, you know, greenhouse gases, they stay in the atmosphere for 100 plus years. Uh, the situation will be getting worse and climate change is the biggest problem of our time, bigger than coronavirus. So this problem is not going anywhere. 2020 is predicted to be the third hottest year on record. And we all notice that this problem remains, corona or not corona. And uh, the third risk I wanted to highlight that is relevant uh, across the sectors, but for hospitality is the cybersecurity because we all buy online more, we pay online more due to hygiene processes. We have more touchless um, points of uh, during check-in or during the payment or anywhere. There is a lot of exchange of contracts, digital contracts, exchange of data in order to track uh, coronavirus. Uh, spread. So all this puts at risk the security of data. Uh, it can lead to data leakage and this can be a serious problem. But uh, if we look at this risk, uh, the sustainable approach dictates that we seize the opportunities. And this is where I would like to highlight how in hospitality in particular, we uh, see that in order to face this risk, we also face uh, see the opportunities. So for the risk of human rights, we see the um, a bigger importance into going for not only corporate social responsibility, taking care of the society, but uh, having this approach of the creating a shared value with the society where we look for the local needs if the uh, society is going, uh, becoming more impoverished, uh, the role of the hotel can be to share its expertise in creating, you know, helping the young people to get the proper education, find the job in the tourism, and this way develop a local economy and create a safer environment due to economic growth that is welcoming for the tourists. So this is one example. Creating shared value can be as simple as uh, collecting the hygiene products and distributing for, for these purposes or using the linens for making masks. So that, that, that what Kempinski was working at um, as, as examples of some initiatives. As for the second risk of uh, uh, climate change, uh, I would like to highlight that we see due to Corona, you know, technology providers, they also they face difficulties now in supplying technology, who's going to buy their technology, nobody has money. So they are more welcoming this uh, model of profit sharing where they supply technology for energy efficiency for free. And uh, from the profit that we make from the cost saving, 
uh, we share until we buy off this technology. So we are leading negotiations with these technology providers, such as for the meters, submeters, and for, for, for kitchen equipment on a global scale, where they're more keen on supplying technologies now uh, for free and profit sharing model, uh, uh, whereas before it might have been difficult. So uh, this, this is an opportunity nowadays. And this again, uh, you know, prevents this risk of carbon price that is coming soon with all the countries uh, running for the carbon neutrality race, you know, including China. So uh, this moves us uh, closer to this opportunity, prevents us from the risk of uh, facing higher utility costs and, and carbon price related risk. And uh, the yeah, third, what I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's great. You're already providing us with a lot of solutions, you know. Um, I was still like trying to find out where each sector is standing and it's, uh, it's gorgeous. Yes, please go on just for the last, uh, ah, for the third yes, point. Yes, yes, and, yeah. and, and the third point that I mentioned, the cybersecurity, mm -hmm. for example, uh, the opportunity here, not only for hospitality globally, but for hospitality, it applies. There is, if you notice, the explosion of the blockchain technology. So we see that, you know, the, the, with the data leakage this, uh, the, that are in threat with the payments and online uh, use of contract, blockchain provides this technology that helps to keep the data safe and you can track, um, uh, you can track where the data were registered. This has a spillover effect on uh, the technology of Internet of Things. You know, Internet of Things is when you put uh, chips in different various points around the building or uh, it can track various devices and uh, it uh, remotely registers, I don't know, let's say energy consumption. It places the data on the server. However, once there is attack either on the server or on one point with this chip, you know, microchip, then the whole system is ruined and you cannot track it back to, to where, where it's been. Now there is a blockchain is joining the forces together with Internet of uh, Things technologies. There are even such concept now actually the company uh, chain of things they call it. So this makes it easier to track it back uh, to, to the origin of the attack uh, and it also helps to uh, manage more data. And this is very important because, for example, uh, as an example of Internet of Things, we have um, uh, we need to maintain equipment in the hotel. So uh, yeah. you, you have this technology for maintenance. You know, you put the chip around the equipment, various equipment that you service. But the same technology does not only help to maintain the equipment properly, which means longer life cycle, you know, for the equipment and so on. But this technology also helps to track cleaning schedule. Uh, at the yeah, same time. Thank you. thank you, Lucien. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you at some point, not because it's not interesting, it's it's a wonderful insight and we think we should have a discussion, especially on that, because it's very, very important and it's part of uh, CSR policies. But I need to give some time to other, other speakers as well. So because Mario, I think Mario is waiting to tell us a little bit more about um, tour operators, what is their perspective of the crisis now? What do you think would be the best solutions for you to get out of the crisis, but in a sustainable way? Can you give us a little update on, on, on tour operator side, Mario? Well, sure, thank you. Uh, to make a long story short, maybe, uh, I think the economic recovery has to go hand in hand with susten sustainability. Uh, the, the two things are two sides of the same metal. We have seen before the pandemic with the over tourism uh, phenomenon we had that uh, the growth of the tourism industry uh, did come more or, less, more or less to a point where it really got dangerous. And we have now uh, a chance to rethink our business models. And uh, I think we really should try to get on a new path of, of tourism development in a sustainable way. What, what I see, what we see is that we have uh, more consciousness also in the tourism industry for sustainable products. Yeah? But uh, people and consumers 
they expect from tour operators or, or providers that they create more sustainable products by themselves. Yeah. So consumer expects to have products and, and uh, services that are as, as sustainable as possible. And uh, this is a new pause and we, we have now a break, of course, and we have a new chance to rethink those business models and do our best to, to get really sustainable products into the market where we can really face the big problems we have. Uh, one is just called up, yeah, the climate change. We have to do something about that. And especially in the tourism industry, this is the big risk we have uh, that we, we have to face now. But Mario, you have been very active in, in the sustainable, I mean, your, your uh, company is a sustainable uh, travel company. But um, all those companies who haven't done anything yet to get uh, CSR policies into, into their business model, uh, do you think that they will be urged as well because of the consumer demand? Is the consumer asking for it? Or is it only your consumers, I mean, your clients, because they are, you know, anyway, more um, educated already on sustainability? Uh, well, I, I, I don't see uh, that there are so many service providers to operators or whatever that didn't do anything about sustainability in their products. Yeah? Every, everybody in the supply chain Try to do a lot yeah, to get more sustainable, uh, to get more sustainable products into the market. But well, I think what we can see now is that uh, really there is a consumer demand for more sustainable products. Yeah. We see that here in Germany, people buy more regional. Yeah, people buy more electric cars now. People really try to live in a conscious way, in a more sustainable way. And this will also, of course, be part of, of uh, the consumer demand for, for travel products, for holiday products. We will see that. And everybody has to do his, his best to get real sustainable products in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that really um, gives us hope, you know, because that, that means that things will have to change because the consumer, in a way, with his purse decides also. Right. So um, there are a lot of opportunities, I understand, in this crisis. But um, what do you think, Mario, which action is required now? What should we do? Is there a joint action required? I mean, now we're talking about the different uh, segments of, of tourism, you know, cruise, trip operators, hoteliers and uh, destinations. But um, is there a joint action required? What is your opinion? Well, I think we, we need some political guidance on the one side. Yeah. Uh, may that be the supply chain management. Yeah. And human rights condition. This is one point. Yeah. Uh, let it be the, the compensation of, of, uh, climate gases. Uh, so there we need some political guidance. And on the other hand, everybody has to do his job. Yeah. Everybody has to, to, uh, do the best in, in the best practice way. To make a most product, uh, most sustainable product. Mm. Julia, do you also think that um, there will be changes in in the gas structure? Will there be more domestic travelers and fewer business travelers? How is Kempinski prepared for that? Yeah, for a period of time, the picture seemed to be uh, quite similar to what happened after 9-11, you know, when there was also some hold on on international travel, long, hold, um, uh, long, uh, long distance flights. Yeah, so now we see the same picture, of course, first uh, the domestic travel prevails, uh, the corporate uh, travel uh, seems to be like uh, for, for sh shorter distance and shorter time as well. And then the effect of the vaccine uh, is expected to show when it will recover. It's expected that uh, the recovery uh, would come uh, towards already well, hopefully at the end of 2021, but most probably uh, in uh, 2022. 
in regards to the my sector you know for the events for the conferences so that's when mm -hmm. the confidence of people pick up and they are ready to do already larger scale meetings because we know that virtual um, meeting cannot replace the real life interaction you know between humans so it will come back but yes it will take time Hmm. So the consumer, of course, plays, plays an immense role. So um, um, what do you think, Lucien, in the cruise industry? I mean, uh, the cruise sector is especially uh, sensitive, be, be, especially if we talk about sustainability. We all know that. So will people be, be going on cruise trips again like they did before, like before Corona? Will they ever? Or will all those um, cruise ships who are not sustainable be be wrecked and and won't be used anymore because the consumer doesn't want to do it or us consumers? On the other hand, I mean, I just heard that there's this uh, cruise to nowhere starting from Singapore, and they just had to turn back because they had one uh, corona patient on board. Um, but this was like their solution that they go they don't go in to a certain destination, but they just uh, cruise around the ocean. But this is not very sustainable, as we all know. So will we still find a lot of travelers who are interested in, in, in going on such trips? What do you think is the future of the cruise industry, Lucien? I think over the last five years, I think cruising was the most targeted tourism field in regards of sustainability. I don't want to discuss if that was all right or all the information out there are correct or not. Yeah, I mean, you can always discuss how public is discussing topics. Um, nevertheless, I think we managed to, to hear um, what was expected from the industry. And I think the, the cruise industry within the maritime industry, I mean, that is our bigger bigger framework we are working on when it comes to legislation, but also when it comes to technology and innovation. There has been such a development done within the last couple of years that I think we are talking here about like two different questions. The other one is, are people perceiving cruising um, as a sustainable or a um, responsible way of, of doing their holidays, even in five or 10 years, I will say yeah, I, I would say yes, because we have a lot of new innovations coming. We are the leaders within the maritime industry when it comes to environmental innovations and everything. So um, even if you are not belonging to the forerunner, um, uh, the technology will diffuse within the whole um, fleet. So that will take some time, but um, as you can see, there are also a lot of hotels out there that are like 20 or 30 years old or whatever. Everything has a charm, but then you have to do some updates. So you are really state of the art. And at the end, the customer is then choosing if they want to go on a new um, and I would say more sustainable um, uh, vessel than going on an old vessel. So there's, of course, the consumer at the end doing the selection. But what we saw, like in January this year, that the cruise industry was really on top. So even with the very strong discussion about the sustainability performance or as the lack of sustainability performance, however you see it or perceive it, um, we still had a high demand for this kind of, 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 of vacations. And I don't think that will go away with the pandemic. We still have, or we started with cruising in July with uh, three of our ships now, and we are still out there and we still have guests on board and they are really, really um, satisfied with our product still. And they are asking us, when can oh, we so go back sorry. and... If I may interrupt you, are you also educating your your clients? I mean, I know that, uh, for instance, studiosos they they educate their clients. They when they book a, a tour, they will. You mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I always uh, telling people I'm not only doing here some some projects and strategies. I'm more or less the moral. Um, guidance here so we have actually a very 
close um, connection with our communications department and also our guest facing departments where we have really a very systematic approach where we are um, educating or communicating with our guests on these sustainability topics. Um, for example, you can, you can actually divide it in um, pre-cruise, so before the cruise, when you are booking and when you get your information, there we have already sustainability information included about what to pack and what kind of souvenirs you should bring or not, or bring your own uh, bags with you so you don't have to rely on plastic bags in, um, in the destinations and all the stuff. Then during the cruise, yeah, where you can do a green and fair arc shore excursion, where you can, um, where you can pick, uh, more, um, like meatless, um, meatless, um, diet or, you know, like there's a lot of, um, cho uh, choosing you can do during the cruise to be more sustainable, actually, or to be more, more conscious about what you consume. And then after the cruise, where we, we try to say the, uh, to tell the people that you can, uh, of course, compensate your whole trip if you want. And you can calculate your, your CO2 footprint. And, um, so we have actually a lot of systematic environmental communication, uh, on signs, um, signages in, in, in flyers, in the online system. So, we are educating them a lot, and sometimes I get from my communications people we don't sh we should we shouldn't be the over teacher, you know, because I mean they are like adults going on a cruise, and they can of course decide what they want to do. But I think it's our responsibility to also provide the information. It's it's thank no, you, thank you, you have to be sensible. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I think um, that's also something to, to drop in for Randy. Randy, does the, um, the GSTC criteria, do you also have uh, um, tools for cruises? Uh, no, we don't have tools for cruise operations per se. We're working with cruise lines and the ports quite uh, heavily, but uh, not to our knowledge is not cruise operation standards. We'd be happy. To, we've talked to CLIA about developing them. We'd be happy to. So. Can I make a few comments about the traveler, Rika? Yes, please. So, you know, we take a global perspective at GSTC. We're working globally. And also in my introduction, you said 24 years I've been in tourism. Next year will be my 40th year. The 24, we're just in the private sector for outbound tour operators. I only work for companies working on all seven continents. And I, I was in the 90s and the early years of this century on the steering committee of the European Tour Operators Association. I've interacted with the U.S. Tour Operators Association, PAT to the Pacific Asia. So for 40 years, I've got a global perspective. And I want to say this. On sustainability, Europe leads the world, right? Nordic countries started flight shame. Consumer traveler awareness on sustainability is stronger in Europe than the rest of the world. 70 million Americans just voted to reelect Donald Trump, who has been hostile to the environment. So I think many times we look kind of at a European perspective, you know, um, but the general traveler of the world, I want to play devil's advocate here, is not so tuned into sustainability. So I'm very encouraged by movement, the companies that are attending sessions like this, not just on screen, but participants. The kinds of companies when I was involved in trade associations that we would interact with are the companies with good management techniques. And in, my, in all those 40 years, we would get complaints from consumers and from suppliers about bad practices from somebody else. Those bad practices never get represented. So my point is this, there are a lot of companies we don't hear from that are not working on sustainability <laughs> and a lot of travelers we don't hear so much from. You know, even in Germany, Lufthansa last year did a survey of their travelers, right? And 78% said they're concerned about climate, they're concerned about the environment. 74% said they would like to do something to support rainforests. Lufthansa makes it easy on their website at the end of a booking to make a carbon offset. You know what their pickup is? 1%. Mm -hmm. That's Lufthansa. You know, and the rest of the world is behind Europe in awareness. So I, I feel like everything we're talking about here is such a mixed bag. There are progressive tour company, travel companies in hospitality, tour operators, every facet, cruise, everybody. There are 
progressive companies, there are progressive travelers, progressive government, we're getting good direction in all of them, but let's be honest, does the mass of travelers really pay attention? You know, I think we just have to temper all of our views here because uh, we don't see market research after market research, what TripAdvisor has done, what Booking.com has done, what TUI has done on the global scene of travelers, what the traveler says on a survey about what they'd like the world to look like is very different from the way they act at point of purchase. We have yeah, a long this, ways to I go. Think, Randy, you're we're we're totally moving in the right. right direction, but we got a long ways to go. That's, that's the old question about willingness to pay. And that's why I also asked Mario before. I mean, his clients are willing to pay for, for a sustainable experience, but the, the, the common traveler is, is just, um, yeah, they just say they want to do it, but they're not willing to pay for it. Or does anybody have different experiences of, of uh, in this group? Uh, yes, um, I, I may add. We have um, we have a, a segment uh, in the hospitality. So there are two uh, kinds of clients that uh, express clearly uh, demand for sustainable uh, service. Uh, one is the corporate booking. Uh, so, for example, if the company needs to book, uh, you know, for a certain period, certain amount of rooms for their employees, and they would choose a hotel that uh, that can prove that they follow sustainability practices over hotels that do not follow, for a simple reason, because in their turn, let's say automotive industry. They are accountable for their supply chain and we are part of their supply chain as providing services to them. So uh, they're accountable to that. They are under more pressure from public, uh, often they're listed companies and they choose supplier that is sustainable. So that is one segment of client. Another segment of client that is demanding sustainable services uh, is in the event sector. There is a demand growing for green or sustainable meetings so called and uh, we are doing this product now for, for for green meetings or sustainable meetings there are no guidelines but there is already a uh, association of um, uh, event managing companies uh, to develop this type of guidelines because clients they want these green meetings they but they don't know what 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 do they want exactly so we need to tell them what there is on the menu and they choose so these two categories are clearly expressing sustainable demand otherwise yes we we are following eco labeling with the earth check for example but we are aware that clients they are not very much they don't care if there is a really earth check certification or not there is not much awareness for that but we follow this because it just helps us to to build sustainable program within Mm. Yeah, so I think we can we can state that there are a lot of uh, yes, Mario. That we we can say that there is a co change in consumer demand, but uh, and we we also have to educate vice versa our clients if we want to change something. But we also need the support of uh, of destinations of policymakers, and that would be my next point. But Mario, could you please just give your comment? Yes, thank you. I would uh, like to add a little bit on what Randy said. Yeah, uh, the compensation, the carbon offsetting rate in, with our clients, it was a little bit higher than the Lufthansa uh, carbon offsetting rate, but it climbed quite drastically in the year of 2019. Yeah, we had at the end a uh, offsetting quote, a voluntarily offsetting quote of almost 10%. So this was the reason why we decided now to make uh, the, the, the carbon offsetting a fully comp compensated travel package that we offer our guests in the year of 2021. So nobody has to decide anymore if he wants to uh, spend more money on, on climate uh, rescue and, and nature and sustainability. Uh, we just include it in the price. And this is what I meant, yeah. Everybody has to do what is necessary mm -hmm. by his own. And this is a decision we took. Uh, I mean, it is a risk, of course, yeah. Uh, it costs money, but the, the client, the consumer, pays for what what he really wants to have. He wants to have the sustainability, yeah. He, he does not want 
to hurt the climate when he's going on vacation and when he's traveling. But we have to take those decisions by, our, by uh, us in our own hand and have to do something. Thank you. Thank you. But And what is the role of destinations, Randy? In this I think the discussion? Destinations have, yeah, I think destinations have a strong role to play about raising more awareness locally among all of their, all of their companies, not just a few progressive ones that we all know. Um, I think they should set minimum standards for sustainability. I think that if you look at hotel star ratings in the world, they've always been about quality. It's do you have a peephole in the door and do you, you know, do this and that for quality and safety and health. Um, hotel star ratings should include some sustainability elements. So government can really integrate sustainability into everything they do. Awareness raising with all the stakeholders, um, scoring systems, incentives for moving to sustainability. People ask me all the time, what's more powerful, the carrot or the stick? I think the carrot is far more powerful. Create incentives, create rewards. Uh, the stick should be sort of, you know, a minimum level of sustainability, you know, some very attainable things to move. The, the bottom is pretty low, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so um, that's that's my view that the, whether it's at the destination level or the policy level at provincial or national, uh, they should be setting mm -hmm. some minimum baselines on sustainability and some core sus sensitive issues. Uh, and then reward star performers and encourage them. And, um, you know, the national government of Germany gives more subsidy to a destination that's a World Heritage Site. Um, wouldn't it be lovely if governments around the world gave subsidies to destinations that have really taken on, on sustainability, not just at their own policy level, but they've monitored and encouraged the private sector locally that the local DMCs are using clean energy vehicles, that the hotels, you know, Copenhagen, which, which wants to be carbon neutral by 2025, could tell us five years ago that 76% uh, of the of, uh, uh, hotel space was certified sustainable in 100% of the meeting space, because Julia's right, we've seen that absolutely too. The mice world and business travel is well ahead of the leisure mm -hmm. travel mm -hmm. world on sustainability. So those kinds of targets and that kind of focus uh, is really what we need from the government. Thank you, thank you, Randy. Um, I just want to see whether we have any questions from the audience. I, I know that well, time is is always a problem if we have interesting discussions. But um, I think we will also come back to these questions. But let us take at least one or two. We still have a little time. Can I see the questions? I can see there is one. It's saying the largest European tourism group, TUI is once again receiving aid worth billions. Do you see yourself disadvantaged as a medium-sized company? I think that goes to you, Mario. Well, um, I would like to have some money from the government too, to be honest. But uh, by now we don't need it really, so that's a good part of it. But of course, yeah, if you see what, what is done for, for Lufthansa and what is done for TUI, I think that the, the medium sized companies and also the travel agents here in, in the German market, uh, not only in the German market, but I've heard it's uh, the, the, the British market, they don't get any, uh, any support from the government, financial support. So, we would also like to see it a little bit broader distributed, let's put it this way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mario. There's another question. Which are the biggest obstacles to um, implement sustainability right now after the crisis? I think, Lucien, maybe you can say something. Or whoever wants to. Lucien, do you hear me? I can hear you actually. I think my connection just, um, yeah, it's took a vacation. Uh, Did, uh, we have a question from the audience which says, which are the biggest obstacles to implement sustainability now after the crisis? 
Can you maybe just give your opinion on that? I think it's a little bit looking on the time frame. If you ask me if I can now spend, you know, thousands of euros for some updates here and there, I I don't have a good answer right now. Because I mean that is coming back to our first your first question. Of course, on a short term basis now the recovery of the business or the operation of the business to 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 guarantee them it's of course the the short term goal right now but um, we have plans here for our sustainability programs in place and we don't question them so um, of course there are obstacles right now but we were strong before the crisis and our ambition is to be also one of the strongest cruise company in terms of sustainable sustainability um, after the crisis what happens now during the crisis and when we can go to kind of a back to normal operation we don't know but um as you can see i'm 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 trying to hail up my face here within the company as well and um to get the sustainability policies in place to work on new ones as well and um uh, it's not always the the um, the case that sustainability actually costs money so being creative and innovative and now having the time to be that yeah um, not caught up in all the operational stuff. It gives us really some some time to to get some more creative ideas out there to the ships, and that's why I'm quite optimistic that we are coming back as strong as we were when we got, when we went into the crisis. Thank you. I have another question uh, going to Randy. Uh, the list of GSTC criteria could include health protection of tourists and locals. Will that be? Um, also included in the criteria. Well, if we think that um, the, the pandemic is not coming just out of uh, out of nothing, I mean, there is a strong interrelation between uh, the destruction of the planet and uh, pandemics. We all know that. So, wouldn't it be uh, wouldn't it make sense to include include those criteria, Randy? Yeah, the GSTC criteria already include health safety. Um, they include the DEI movement on social justice and non-discriminatory policies, the Black Lives Movement or the DEI. The GSTC criteria are quite uh, comprehensive. Uh, health safety is mentioned in both the, the destination criteria and the industry criteria. Yes, that's good. Thank you, Randy. Um, I think, oh, wow, the time has passed so fast and there are so many questions in the chat and so on. I, I would love to, to, um, yeah, to get back to you. And of course, it's not the end of everything. As we know, we are looking into the future. There will be the ITB virtual uh, conference at ITB because ITB now is, uh, we are preparing ITB now for March, beginning of March next year. And there will be a virtual convention as well. And I'm sure we will have to discuss all these uh, subjects we've been uh, trying to talk about right now. Uh, there's so much more to say. And we will also take into account all the questions from, from the audience whom, uh, which couldn't be answered right now. But um, I think what we can say is that yeah, today is, is the day where the European leaders are deciding on the new uh, targets of um, of the climate pro of climate protection. So I think it, we we choose a good day to talk about the necessity to to include sustainable thinking into into the recovery of uh, after COVID nineteen. And as all of you pointed out, we all of us need to do our homework wherever he or she is. If you're working in, as a tour operator, if you are a small agent, if you are an NGO, if you are government, if you are a destination um, organizer, if you're a hotelier, each of us has to do the homework and to include sustainable criteria. And then we can use the opportunities that we have and we can use the opportunity that uh, people are um, more impact, uh, um, yeah, they are more impassionable. They they want to do something, even if they don't have the money, you know, because there is not a big willingness to pay, but there is a willingness for change. So so let us embark on the journey. And um, I'm I'm very happy that you joined me today, that you gave your inputs, 
and we will stay connected. We will do whatever we can to to make it work. I think I really believe in in a, a joint approach from all tourism players all along the supply chain. And um, yeah, I want to thank you, my panelists, and I also want to thank um, the auditorium. And I also want to thank Professor Conradi and his team. And I want to thank uh, ITB for, for giving the platform to sustainability since so many years. So thank you and see you at ITB Berlin now in March, virtually, but we will see each other. <laughs> Bye.